Hello, and thank you for attending our talk, How to Connect Your Device to Wolfram Language. My name is Lambert Chow. I am the Senior Technical Lead for Connected Devices. Together with Nick Lochner, who is interning with the connectivity team, we'll be showing you how you can easily connect the device of your choice to the Wolfram Language. We're at the cusp of an exciting new era of connectivity, devices, data, and computation. Wolfram has taken on an ambitious goal of injecting sophisticated computation into everything. Connecting to devices and sensors are integral to acquiring data for computations, gaining new insights from analytics, and taking actions based on those insights. In this talk, we'll show you connected devices technologies we introduced to the Wolfram language with Mathematica 10. Then we'll show you how you can connect your own device to the Wolfram language by writing a device driver. You'll be able to create an integrated experience and take advantage of the powerful analytics and visualization capabilities of the Wolfram technology stack. We'll start by showing you how to connect to a digital oscilloscope using serial I.O. by writing code in the Wolfram language. Then we'll show you other ways to write a device driver using library link in C++ code to capture and play audio using the port audio library, as well as using Java and JLink to capture images from a net webcam using the OpenCV library. So the Connected Devices project is the first step in our strategy, with the goal of understanding what types of devices are out there. This is a curation project cataloging devices, what they measure, and what they do. It's a website available at devices.wolfram.com, and you, you, you go there, you see a catalog of various devices, and if you click through on one of them, for example, you'll see specs on the quantities they measure and other specifications. As the next step, we introduce the Connected Device Framework, which provides support in the Wolfram language. It adds seamless integrated interaction with devices. Here you see examples of possible connections using the framework, and you'll see you can click through here and go to the new Mathematica 10 page to explore more of these. To do this, we introduced a suite of new functions, including those to open, configure, close, and find devices. Having connected to these devices, your primary interest will be input-output. And we provided functions to read and write data, both as a single parameter, a list, a time series, or a buffer. After we've taken care of I.O., you might want to do things too. So, for example, turn on the lights or tell a robot to turn left. To do this, we provided functions device execute and device execute asynchronous, as well as advanced interfaces to streams in the Wolfram language, as well as asynchronous tasks. Later in this, in this talk, you'll see how to use these functions as we write a driver in the Wolfram language. So now you've seen an overview of the Wolfram language functions for interacting with devices. We provide built-in device drivers for interacting with cameras, serial ports, Arduinos, or GPIO. In addition to providing an extensive suite of built-in functionality, the Wolfram language has always been about empowering you to build tools for your computations. Perhaps you may be thinking of writing your own device driver. What are the advantages of doing so? Well, you can create a customized driver to suit your needs. Perhaps you have a specific device that you need support for right now. You can choose to implement only a small section of the device's functionality and quickly create a driver you need. Or you may have a notebook where you've written some functions to interact with your device. Now you can take advantage of the device framework to integrate those functions, manage the execution flow, and make them easier to use. Some specific examples. For example, you may have an instrument in your lab that you need for your project. You can quickly write a device driver to integrate their, that functionality. Or perhaps you're a maker for building, working on building your own circuit or shield or to work with an Arduino. You could write a driver you know, code using the Arduino link, or you can encapsulate that as your own device. And finally, you could extend and customize an existing driver that you need some additional functionality for and make that your own new driver inherited from that for your convenience. So the device framework, how does it work? Well, it does so by this concept known as inversion of control or delegation. When a user calls device open, 
for your driver, the device framework knows to call and execute an open function that you've written and registered ahead of time, and similarly for other functions. When writing a device driver, your mindset will be different from how you may be used to coding in the Wolfram language. You are no longer the user, but a Wolfram language developer. Before, as a user, you are directing the flow of execution. Do this, do that, and then that. Instead, the user of your driver dictates execution flow. When they want to open, configure, read, or write, as the user evaluates those functions, the device framework executes the corresponding functions you have written and delegated for handling those requests. This is done by using the device class register function, where you declare the name of your driver and then provide the delegate functions to be called, which are provided as options. For example, here you can find the various basic functions that are often needed to write a driver. In addition, there are advanced functions for handling these functionality that are more complicated that you may need sometimes. But note that you don't have to implement all these functions, only those that you need. The device framework will handle the rest appropriately. So now let's write a driver for a digital oscilloscope. For those of you who are unfamiliar with an oscilloscope, it's an instrument for measuring the electric signals as waveforms. We'll code this in the Wolfram language using the serial driver. We'll build this driver organically, write code in a notebook to talk to the oscilloscope, and then easily turn that into functions for a device driver. In this example, we'll be using a Tektronix TDS-210 digital oscilloscope. It's a bit of a classic, a two-channel digital oscilloscope. The scope we have here has a RS-232 module that allows us to communicate to, with it using the serial driver. We'll do this using a USB to serial adapter that we plug into our laptop and then connect to the oscilloscope using a null modem cable. In addition, to provide an electric signal for us to measure, we have a function generator that will provide a sine wave uh, as an electric signal to the oscilloscope, and we are not connecting that to talk to Mathematica. Here, I have a webcam showing you the actual setup that we do have. And you see here the oscilloscope with the display and the various measurement parameters. This is the USB to serial adapter that we're using, an example of one. And also below is the function generator. To communicate with the oscilloscope, we'll look up commands in the oscilloscope's programming manual that came with it. And the commands we use are based on the what's known as the SCUPI standard. To get started, we need to make some design choices by choosing what functionality to provide and how to implement it. For our example driver, we'll implement functionality for opening and closing the device, as well as measuring waveform parameters such as frequency, period, and voltage. And finally, of course, we'll also measure the actual waveform itself. We'll choose to name the device class TDS210 after the oscilloscope model. So let's start communicating with the oscilloscope using the serial driver. We'll be sending bytes or ASCII characters back and forth. To open the port, you'll need to find the serial port address for the oscilloscope, often in the manual for your serial adapter, or in a device manager or slash directory of your operating system. For our case, we have this slash dev address. And if you're on Windows, the address may often look like something like COM1. Well, now we'll open the serial port using device open with the serial driver. And you see we get a device object back with a dynamic summary of various information and you can click this and expand it to get properties which would be available if there were any avail available they would show up here. So let's query the, the identity of the port by writing IDN question mark here which is the, with the question mark indicating a query and then the backslash R or carriage return is important in serial communication to you uh, and often used to delimit a, a particular command. 
we write that to the port, and then we read it back the response using device read buffer up to the read terminator of another carriage return. This comes back as a list of bytes, which we turn into a string using from character code. And you see the oscilloscope responds with its brand and model name, as well as firmware information. So now let's close the serial port and turn this into a device driver function. We'll be writing the open function. And when writing the open function, you can expect the I handle or initialization or manager handle to be given to you, as well as arguments that the user provides in the open command. This I handle is for advanced functionality in case you want to set up your driver or anything. And we don't need that here, so we'll be getting a null for that. Inside the open function, you're responsible for executing code needed to open device. And if that is all goes well, you have to return a device handle for identifying this particular device. And it should be unique that you come something that you come up with. You can use the create UUID function or include your driver name in some combination of a counter to provide something reasonably unique. Here you see we use the prototyping code inside the scope open function. We open the serial port, we check whether that succeeded, after which we query it and do some quick parsing to make sure that it is indeed a Tektronix oscilloscope. If that's not true, we return dollar sign failed, but otherwise we choose to return the serial object itself, the device object, as our unique device handle. Similarly, we want to divide, define a scope close function and this time we're provided both the I handle and the device handle as in our arguments. And all we need to do is close that underlying serial port and that, that is the de device handle, which is the device object. Finally, we register the scope open and scope close functions and test the driver. Now we'll device open the TDS210 driver instead of the serial driver at that port. You can use the devices function to query the list of open devices or known devices, and you see the serial underlying serial object is here as well as our newly created TDS210 object. And now we close that device object, and you see that it updates dynamically to show that it's not been, it's no longer connected. Now let's do a device read example. The oscilloscope can measure parameters such as frequency, period, mean peak-to-peak -peak or cyclic RMS voltage for a particular waveform on a particular channel. From our design, we choose to use device read to measure these parameters using what's known as an immediate measurement for the oscilloscope. So let's do the device read example. The oscilloscope can measure parameters such as frequency, period, mean, peak-to-peak, -peak, or cyclic RMS voltage for a waveform on a particular channel. For our design, we'll choose to use device read to measure these parameters using what's known as an immediate measurement. To read a parameter for a particular channel, once we've opened the serial port, we need to set its source and we send it the immediate measurement source command with channel one as the argument. Similarly, we need to set a measurement parameter by sending a, the type as frequency. After that, we read back the value by sending the value query command, and we turn it into a string with from character code and interpret it as a number in the Wolfram language. And you see that we measure 1,000 hertz, which is great since that's what we set the sine wave to. So now let's close the port and write our read function. So device read will choose to have it take a channel source and a measurement type as the argument. And then you can cr add query for multiple uh, parameters and sources using a nested list format here. For the read function, we'll expect an I handle and device handle as well as the arguments provided. We'll start by defining the list of acceptable parameters and create an internal measurement function that does basically what we've done above by setting the source, the type, and querying the value and interpreting the value, 
the red value. We'll wrap that with the scope read function for the simple case. And then for the nested value case, we'll map the I measure function over our arguments. Let's register the scope read function and test it out. And you see we can open the TDS 210 port. We can read the frequency value on channel 1, 1,000 hertz, the mean value on channel 1, which is very close to 0. That's good since we're uh, measuring a sine wave, we should average to 0. And then we could also, of course, read both of them at the same time. Now let's close the device object. Now for the final payoff, let's read an entire waveform from the oscilloscope. We'll open the port, and to communicate with the scope, we choose to set the data encoding to a binary positive integer encoding using this command here. And you see that we read back and indeed we set that to RP binary. Now another thing you should know is that we can read the waveform preamble from the device using this command. And you see what it gives back is actually voltage and time scale setting. And you'll need this to rescale the values we read back from the 8-bit values you get to an actual voltage and time measurement. We'll leave this as an exercise for the proverbial reader. We'll also need to set the range of capture by setting the stop point, and we'll hard code that in this example to 2500, which is the full range you can measure. Now let's read the curve back using the curve query command, and once we've read that back and stored it into the raw bytes variable, we can do a quick plot of that, and you see the sine wave. Now let's close that port and write our read buffer function. We'll choose to implement the syntax where we query the device object for the buffer values, values up to a particular criterion for a particular parameter. Here the criterion meaning the number of samples we want to query, and the parameter is the source or channel. And for the read buffer function, again, you should expect a list of handles as well followed by the arguments. And for our scope read buffer function, we basically do the same thing we did above in prototyping. Also note that we have this additional uh, couple lines here where we're when we actually, when you query for the curve value, the first bytes it returns actually tells you how many characters are returned, and this is code to parse stats. And then finally, we rescale and renormalize as best we can for this example. Similarly, we'll add a, a syntax case where all will map to 2,500 samples, and we can now register the scope read buffer function. And now let's test it out. Open the port to the TDS 210. And then you can read the buffer into the waveform variable from channel 1. And we can list line plot that waveform. Excellent. And you see it looks pretty close to what we measure with the scope itself. So now let's close that port. So now you've just seen how you can write a driver in the Wolfram language, and how easy it is to turn cells in a notebook into a driver right before your eyes. But that's not the only way you can code a driver. Often devices will provide a library or SDK in another language. The Wolfram language provides many ways to write and bind code from other languages, including Library Link, or WSTP, formerly known as MathLink for C and C++, or JLink for Java. And what you, when you do that, what you wind up with is a particular type of driver architecture, where at the top is the user, user interaction with the functions device open, device read, and so forth, and at the bottom is the actual device that you want to interface with. In between is the device framework managing the execution flow and calling functions in the Wolfram language device driver which has a part written in the Wolfram language and in turn wraps a module responsible for interfacing with the device. That may be the serial driver in the Wolfram language, as in the example we just did, or a library link or WSCP or JLink module code that wraps a third-party library or an SDK written in another language. 
This third-party library is often an SDK or a dynamic library provided by the device manu manufacturer, or perhaps an open source library that provides the functionality you need. In the next part of this talk, Nick will show you two examples of how to do this, first starting with library link. Now we're going to have a brief introduction to library link. Library link allows you to write C code that's packaged into a library that's loaded into the Wolfram language at runtime. Um, you can build a library link library with the create library function from the C compiler driver package. Now we'll dive into the specifics of writing library link code. Every library link library will have um, these boilerplate Wolf Wolfram library get version, Wolfram library initialize, and Wolfram library uninitialize functions. In Wolfram Library Initialize, you can initialize needed data structures and third-party libraries. In Wolfram Library Uninitialize, you can free data structures and disconnect from devices. This is an example function that will take an integer as the input, add one to it, and then return the result. Every library link function has this standard argument structure, where Wolfram Library libdata is a struct that allows you to access functions in the kernel mint argc, that's the Mathematica integer type uh, with the number of arguments passed into your function, and m argument args is an array of arguments passed into your function. m argument res is what you use for the return value. So you see we use m argument get integer on args sub 0 to get the first argument passed into your function, which is the only argument. Then we add one to it, and then we use m argument set integer to return the result. Note that the function actually returns an error code in the C code. And if you return library no error, then the value with m argument set integer is returned to the Wolfram language. But if you return an error code, then the error code is returned to the Wolfram language. Now we can load this demo function with library function load. The first argument is the name of your library or the full path. The second argument is the name of your function. The third is the list of input types, and the fourth is the output type. Now we can pass in 10 to this function, and we see it returns 11. It adds 1 to the input. Now we will go over writing an example driver that discovers audio devices on your system, captures audio, and plays back audio. We'll use the third-party port audio library for our implementation. And we see that we register our driver using device class register, uh, similar to the oscilloscope example, but in this driver we are going to be using device properties which allow you to set and read single values from a device. We use the properties sample rate which is in Hertz for the sample rate of uh, playback and capture of audio, number of input channels on a device, and number of output channels. The pre-configure function allows us to set these properties immediately after device open but before returning the device object to the user and the set property function defines how we allow the user to set the values of these properties. Here's an overview of the C code. Our library link header has the standard boilerplate functions here and then we have the functions for our library. Find devices will use port audio to discover audio devices on the system get device name, get input channels, and get output channels will allow us to get the name of a discovered device and the number of channels respectively. Read data from stream allows us to capture audio and write data to stream allows us to play back audio. Now we can load our library and these functions into the Wolfram language. With library function load, the first argument is the full path to our library, second argument is the name of each function, the third is the list of input types, and the fourth is the output type. Now this is the beginning of our C code, containing the boilerplate functions, and we also initialize an array of devices and the number of devices currently discovered. The Wolfram library get version simply returns the version of library link that this was built with, the Wolfram library initialize function, we call the port audio initialize function. And in Wolfram library uninitialize, we terminate the port audio library and free our devices array. In our find devices function, we call port audio get device count to get the number of devices on the system. And then we initialize our devices array. 
and then we iterate through each discovered device and store the device info in our array. Then we use mArgument set integer to return the number of devices discovered. Our get device name function simply takes in an integer as the argument, which is the index of the device in our array in the C code, and then looks up its name and returns it with set utfh string. Now we can use this from the Wolfram language. We use an association where the key is the name of each device and the value is a list where the first part of the list is the index of our device in the C code and the second part is a UUID created to uniquely identify the device. Here is code to create this association in the Wolfram language. And then our find function simply returns a list of the names of each device. Now we can call find devices function and you see it returns a list of device objects with the discovered audio devices on the system. Now to create our open function, we implement the get input channels and get output channels functions. These are similar to getting the device name and we just return the number of input channels and output channels for a device passed in. Now our open function which will open a device with the given name simply looks up the device handle from our association with the name passed in and if it exists we return the device handle. We also have a function to open the default device if, um, if no arguments are passed in. This simply returns the first device handle in our association. Now we have our pre-configure function which allows us to set the properties for the number of input channels and output channels before returning the device object to the user. We use the device framework device set property function to set these properties and we use our get input channels and get output channels functions to get the number of input channels and output channels for the device passed in. Now we can open the default output device in the Wolfram language with device open. And you see when expanding the device object, we have the number of input channels, output channels, and sample rate. And we'll go over the set property function, which allows the user to modify properties. Our function for input channels and output channels is defined to throw a read-only message because we can't change the number of channels on a device. But we do allow the user to change the sample rate. After some argument checking, then we use device set property to set the sample rate to the value that the user passed in. Now we can show reading our device properties and writing the device properties. We can multiply the sample rate by two and we see that it changes. But we can't change the number of output channels. We see it throws a read-only message and does not change. Then we'll go over writing the write data to stream function, which allows us to play back audio. The important parts are highlighted in yellow on the right side and magnified on the left side so we don't get bogged down in detail about the port audio implementation. So at the beginning of our function, we take in the device index as the first argument, the sample rate as the second, then we look up our device in our array in the C code. And then the third argument is the audio data to play back, and we store that in an M tensor. Then we initialize the port audio stream. And then finally, we write the audio data to the stream. We loop over each frame segment in the audio data, and then loop over each channel, store this in the stream buffer, and then we call the port audio write stream function. After the loop is finished, we stop the stream. Now we can use this in our driver. We create a write function which uh, looks up the device object from the device handle, which we need to do to access the sample rate property. Then we get the data from the argument for the function. And we do some argument checking, and then we call the library function for writing to the stream, uh, where the first argument is the index of the device, the second argument is the sample rate, and the last argument is the data. Now we can use this in the Wolfram language. We open our output device, and now we can read in some mono audio data. And then we can write this to our device. Our function also works with stereo audio. We can also modify the sample rate to play back at a different speed. Here I multiply the sample rate by 2.
Now we can write our function to capture data from a device with input channels. This is similar to writing to a device. The first argument is the device ID. The second argument is the number of channels. The third is the sample rate. And the fourth is the number of seconds to capture for. Then we initialize the port audio stream. And now we can read data from the stream. We initialize an mTensor and then retrieve the mReal array of the data to write to. Then for each frame, we read from the stream and then iterate over each channel in the data and store that in the output channel array. Then we can stop the stream and then we can use mArgument set mTensor to return the captured data. Now we can use this from the Wolfram language. Our read function will look up the device from the device handle again so we get, can get the sample rate property. Then we call the read from stream function with the index of the device, the number of channels, sample rate, and the number of seconds. And then we can return the data. Now I can show using this from the Wolfram language. We open the input device and then we see that this input device has two channels. So we will capture two channels for three seconds. Now I'm capturing with two channels for three seconds. And now I can play back the recorded data. I open the output device and then I use device write. Now I'm capturing with two channels for three seconds. We can also capture at a different sample rate. If I capture at half the sample rate and then play back at the standard sample rate, we will play back twice as fast. Now I'm capturing more data for three seconds. Oh, I can write this captured data and you'll see it's twice as fast. Now, I'm more data for three seconds. now we can go over using JLink to write a Java driver. Our driver will open the default camera and allow us to capture the current image. We'll use the third party OpenCV library for our implementation. The Java code is a standard Java class. We, here we initialize the OpenCV library, and then we have an object to represent the camera. We have the open function, which will initialize the default camera, and then return true if it's open, false if it's not. We have two functions to get the width and the height of the camera's image in pixels, which we will use as device properties. And our capture function will return a byte array with the current image. Here's an example of some data manipulation you might have to do. Since the Wolfram language uses the red, green, blue uh, color formatting, but OpenCV uses blue, green, red, we have to swap the red and blue bytes of the image. Then we have the close function, which will close the default camera. Now we can use our Java code in the Wolfram language. We have to use needs JLink to load the JLink package, and then JLink install Java to initialize JLink, and then call JLink add to class path with the directory with the OpenCV library and the directory with our compiled Java class. Now we can load our camera class using JLink Java new. Now we can call the camera functions. We can call the camera open function to open the camera and use get width and get height to get the width and the height of the image in pixels. And then we can use camera capture to capture the current image. Here we partition the data into the RGB elements and then partition it into image rows. And then we finally use image to create an image. And then we can use camera close to close the camera. Now we can put this into a driver. The open function simply calls the Java open function, and then if it's true, we create a UUID for the device handle. The close function calls camera close. Our set property function just throws a read-only message because we can't modify the width and height of the image. The read function is simply the code from the previous slide, and our preconfigure function will get the width and the height of the image and use device set property to set the width and the height. Our find function returns an empty list because we only have one device, the default camera, for this driver. And then we register this with device class register. And now we can use our driver. The find devices function we see returns the default camera. 
and we can use device open to open it. We see that the width and height are set to the width and height of the image. We can use device read to capture the current image. We can also use device read with the class name of our driver to automatically open and call our read function. So this would open the default device if it was not already opened. And we can read from our properties, but we can't set them. And finally, we can close our device. So let's talk a little bit about how to organize your code. So far, you've seen us seem to implement most of our code in the notebook itself. But what you should really do is place your code in a .wl or a .m file named after your driver. For example, the oscilloscope code we wrote should go into a tds210.wl file, which you see here. And we've taken the driver functions and just simply place them into a Wolfram language package file and register it at the very end. And you'll see examples of this with the rest of the drivers as well included with the notebook. So where should your driver be located? It can be found in several locations and loaded automatically by the Wolfram language. First is the directory your notebook is in, or a special directory where the system default drivers are installed inside the Mathematica installation directory, or anywhere on your path will also work. Now finally, let's talk about how you could get started. You've seen several ways to code a driver, including using the Wolfram language, library link, or JLink. In addition, you can use WSTP, or what was formerly known as MathLink, to code C or C++, or on Windows, you can use .NET link. Some development tips for you. As you're coding, it's best to code interactively and just code bits and test it out, code bits and test it out. You can always use get to reload your driver during development. And as continuing with develop this path of developing iter iteratively, you should prototype in a notebook. When you're coding in other languages, your workflow should be to write the, language, write the code in the C language, for example, compile it, write a small wrapper for those few functions in the Wolfram language and test it iteratively. So this should hopefully get you started well on your way to integrating your device with the Wolfram language. Some other resources that might be helpful, we have a documentation guide on the various functions available for connected devices, as well as a tutorial giving you into detailed developer information on how to write a device driver. And finally, we also include with Mathematica several demo drivers which you can find at this location. And of course, there's always the Wolfram community where you can ask questions or post and show examples of the work you've done. Thank you for attending our talk.